Well, I noticed a lot of boxing memorabilia. We got some gloves over here, pictures everywhere. Who's the boxer? Me. You're the boxer? Yeah. You're a tough guy. Yeah, tough enough. Really? What could you do? To you? Yeah. <laughs> So this dude's plan to start a fight in this bar is to single out the oldest guy in the bar and point out the fact that he was a boxing champion to justify that that's okay. Not fighting the guy with the mullet, not fighting the guy with the sticks, not fighting the other guys. He's going to start the fight with the old man. Not fighting Richie's brother. He's going to start a fight with the old man because he saw some boxing memorabilia. <laughs> There's plenty of boxing memorabilia. He's tough enough. Uh, I, I, didn't, I didn't see any boxing memorabilia, Drew. I saw some boxing memorabilia. It was it's like some old gloves. <laughs> like what? What? The, this guy boxed like 50 years ago, and, yeah. it, and he's gonna he's gonna kick his butt now. Yeah. That's his plan. And you know, as a cop, he provoked that fight, Drew. Yeah. I mean, nobody oh. was fighting until he he started provoking people. We've got a list of this guy's transgressions, but before we get to that, <laughs> welcome back. <laughs> this is episode 86, 86 of the Last Road Podcast. We're still here. We're if you're looking for here. a website, thelastrowpodcast.com. Follow us on Twitter at the Last Row Pod. Check out our Facebook page. Head out to Spotify. Hit subscribe. Leave us a five star review on Apple Podcasts if you're enjoying the show. Same with Pod Chaser. Thanks to everybody at Love One so far. Chaser we finally did it. Bad way. He's back. The triumphant return of Steven Seagal. Steven Seagal, and the Last Row is back for Out for Justice, 1991. <laughs> <laughs> the action martial arts there, Steven Seagal There movie. wasn't a lot of martial arts in this There was a little bit of choppy choppy little uh, bit. Directed by John Don't call him Johnny Flynn <laughs> That's another actor actually yeah. Johnny Flynn Yeah. IMDB 6.1 out of 10 Too low Too low. Rotten Tomatoes 23% Way too low Way too low <laughs> Metacritic 38% it's Just way too low it's a, little bit, a little bit way too low It's cratered a little is, bit, is, a little tiny bit of weight too low. I'm in the Marriottis Trench yeah, on this one, yeah. man. That's how low it is. Too low. Gino Felino <laughs> or Gino Felino <laughs> is a Brooklyn police detective whose partner and longtime friend is shot down in the street in front of his wife and children. That's putting it politely. Unbelievable. The culprit is Richie Madano, a drug lord. I don't know if he's really a drug lord. Here. <laughs> we'll get into it. In the he's neighborhood. Yeah, he's a, user. Dro- he's, a, he's a lord user <laughs> who has known Gino since they were kids. <laughs> With the blessing of his captain, Gino <laughs> is sent alone into the drug underground to find Richie by any means necessary. Along the way, Gino discovers and uncovers <laughs> secrets about his deceased partner that he never suspects radar he, he went into the drug underground like he wasn't in anything he went into a bar yeah like, he went what into was a the bar. drug underground the bar the bar was un- literally underground he had to yeah. walk down steps to get into the bar there, there was more drugs in his partner's desk than were in the would, rest of the movie would you call the mafia like an underground organization no i think or they're are they like, they're very much above ground in, aren't they yeah they're in the yeah. open yeah like I don't know, an underground organization to me is like some secret thing. Like the mafia is totally out in the open. They're just very smart about not getting caught. Yeah. Right? Well, right? they're in your face. They're grinning. Yeah. They, you yeah. know they're there and yeah. they, they, you can't get them. You need the Rico case. That's what they need. It's it's ridiculous. But so, yeah. Before we get into it, fun fact, Drew. So this f- movie has a very famous bar fight scene. Oh, yeah. And, you know, it makes sense because the writer of this film – had another writer credit on uh, one of our, you know, all-time Last Row podcast backlog episodes. A little bit of a movie called Roadhouse. Writer R. Lance Hill, a.k.a. David Lee Henry. They're David both the same Lee person. Henry. Don't ask me. I don't know. I don't know why. <laughs> but a guy's a suited him for some reason. But yeah, the guy who wrote Roadhouse wrote this movie. I'm a little so, disappointed at the lack of wet jeans in this movie. Yeah, I mean, there's no wet jeans. There's there's a dipped in water ponytails. But yeah, there's no there's oh, no wet jeans. God, when we get to him, I yeah. have a lot to say about this yeah. ponytail. There's a lot to say. Before we get that, let's hit the taglines. Yeah. A lot of weak ones here, in my opinion. Pure adrenaline pumping, jaw dropping thrills. Generic. Let's move on. Steven Seagal is 
Oh, for justice. Uh, that I'll accept. That's fine. I like I like his three word titles. We've talked about this in the past. I love the three word titles as his like calling card. I would like to rename the next one here because I think it should be changed. But it says he's a cop. It's a dirty job, but somebody's got to take out the garbage. He's okay. a dirty cop in this. Okay, you could say he's a cop, and it's a dirty wait. It's a dirty job, and he's a dirty cop. He's a but dirty. Somebody's got to take out the garbage. Yeah, I got. We got a list Fixed. of his transgressions. Yeah. No Fixed. sleep to Brooklyn. That's just theft. Weak. That's thievery. <laughs> they they played the song in the movie though. I'm surprised they got the rights for it. They did. Yeah, yeah, they did. They did. Maybe it was part of this budget. Fourteen million yeah. million dollars. Fourteen million million. Is that higher or lower than you'd expect? Back in '91, it's a lot of money. I mean, that's a lot of money. I don't know, like. There wasn't a lot to this. I don't know. There's a lot no. of a lot of gunshots, a lot of <laughs> a lot of weaponry, a lot of blanks. Yeah, cumulative worldwide gross thirty nine point six seven three. Now I don't know what the time period is. This is IMDb giving us the money, but not yeah. a bad return there. I don't know. I feel like that's I don't know. They more than they obviously they more than doubled, and um, with my math serves me correct, almost triples, right? Yeah, but yeah. I don't know how well these movies do. Excuse me. Overseas. It, it was number one. It, it 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 was. I saw on somewhere it opened. It was the third consecutive, I think, number one movie that he had that yeah. opened up. So it was popular. No, it was popular. But I feel like is is this an American movie, Drew? Like, is this a movie that does well overseas? He he seems like the type of person that would have overseas appeal because they yeah. like the like it was a, a thing, right? Huh. Like, like they they said that. You know, a lot of the f- the foreign um, like audiences like the action films, the American yeah. action films at this time. So I don't know, maybe it was. But this is like you know, uh, I don't know, kind of a dumbed down bang bang shoot 'em up. Not that yeah. not that I didn't enjoy it. It's Death Wish. I mean, yeah. it's a Death Wish. It's kind remake, of Death essentially. Wish. It's kind of Death Wish for the yeah. most part, right? Yeah. So yeah. I put on here that it it has no awards. I think it won the award of one of my favorite Seagal movies. So, so yeah, so it won the award for best Seagal movie. Best, it's up there. Best Seagal I mean, movie. It's one of I the best ones. Yeah, it's, it's debatable, but it's certainly the conversation. So let's talk about him because we've done, is this our third one? We've done Hard to, or we've done hard to Kill. Okay, it's our fourth. We've done Under Siege 2, Dark Territory. We've done Hard to Hold Kill. We've, we've done, done Marked for Death. Marked for Death. So this will be our fourth one. And we'll put all the links to the old Seagal movies in the show notes so you guys can check it out. Go back and listen to him. We had a lot of fun with these movies. But the first topic that we just have to talk about, and it's not a stranger to this podcast, is Steven Seagal kind of being a piece of crap. Yeah, kind of a kind of a D bag on set. He, he's yeah. kind of a scumbag as a person, and it's it's well documented yeah. that oh, yeah. this, you know, I mean, I don't know if there's official evidence, but a lot of things, right? We talked about his relationship with Kelly LeBrock, his his pre ex relationship with Kelly LeBrock, all the types of things that he's done, you know, to people. Uh, sexual misconduct, criminal transgressions, allegations that yeah. some have gone somewhere, some have gone nowhere, but you know it's true. It, it's Look, you watch this guy, and there's a couple pieces of trivia here that will hit you all up with, but there's a lot of mounting evidence. Now, IMDb doesn't lie. Wikipedia doesn't lie. So we're going to take it as truth. Yes. <laughs> but like the best one that I saw in here was... He, according, you heard it in the intro, right? This guy's got a stellar Brooklyn accent. Boxing, blah, 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 blah. Or not. He apparently told William Forsyth that he needs to work on his Brooklyn accent. And Forsyth, <laughs> as a Brooklyn native, said, trust me, you do. <laughs> the balls, Drew. The balls Listen, on this man. This is like Vin Diesel trying to tell The Rock, it's, like, I took his performance out. Like, I gave him. It's exactly Vin Diesel and, yeah. and, and The Rock. Like, William Forsyth's a good actor. Like, yeah. he's a really good actor. Yeah. It's imagine, the same type of thing. Imagine being a professional actor and Stephen Seagal giving you notes. Imagine it, Drew. And I don't, I don't know if this next one is true or not, but apparently, it's according true. to IMDb, the movie was over 30 minutes longer, which included a lot more plot details and character development, which would make sense because it seems a little disjointed. But Stephen Seagal cut some of William Forsythe's scenes because he felt that he was upstaging him. So... Does Steven Seagal a final cut on these movies? Well, he's a producer. He's one of the producers. Uh, all right. well, and that, Warner yeah, Brothers at this time, I think what was this his third like big movie? And Warner Brothers, he was probably he probably had, you know, to, ability to do whatever he wanted. Yeah. They probably said whatever. Yeah, the move well, I have two thoughts, because the movie did the movie is fine at ninety minutes, in my opinion. Yeah. It didn't need to be two hours, but the two hours. There will as we'll as we'll get into, yeah, there are some like I don't know. 
assumptions made about characters that would make more sense had had we you know learned more about them well and had they cut 30 minutes what if they cut yeah. a different 30 minutes you yeah. know and left certain yeah. character building into the, it the main thing being how is steven zagal kind of in the mafia yeah in this movie <laughs> they worship him <laughs> they while, worship him while maintaining being a clean cop yeah there's yeah. no way yeah there's no so, way there's a story not being told here that's in those 30 minutes i feel uh, the the next one is is right in line with with a Steven Seagal type story here, right? I don't know. I don't know this, but you know, apparently according to IMDb, and I'm going to butcher her name, but Juliana Margulis is that how you say it? Good enough, Mar- Margulis. Good enough. She was cast specifically by Seagal for her for this her role in the film, but she didn't enjoy working with him. There was an interview where it said that she used to see Seagal working on other projects for WB, and she was a regular on ER. And he would always tell her, quote, Margulis, come over here and show me some respect. I'm sorry, Drew, can you, can you run that back in a Seagal accent for me, please? <laughs> Margulis, come over here and show me some respect. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you. <laughs> no, see, I don't do it. I don't do it. I'm like doing the Gino Felino and the, the New Orleans. Yeah. Like, you, you I, did the, y'all think y'all can beat me in the kitchen? Margulis, come on over here and show me some respect. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're, the, you're much better at that than me. And she bluntly said... Quote, he's not someone I keep in contact with. Yeah, that's pretty <laughs> Come on. pretty standard and like that's that's very formal. Do a it, formal way of saying, uh, get away from me, you creep. No, I don't want to get sued for what is it, libel or slander, whichever one is the one with spoken word, but there it was is another slander. slander. Slander, right? So there's another one that said he was really difficult to work with, obviously. And at one point he was driven to tears on set because a light went out in his trailer. And then he tried to blame it on a teamster and have him fired, but he was yeah. unsuccessful. I don't think he was crying, but I totally see him firing some poor schlub yeah. for something that was not his fault. And, yeah. and he also broke William Forsythe's front tooth when he shoved him into the brick wall in that final fight between <laughs> Gino and him. And then, the, think- the, yeah, the icing on the cake is that he offered the producers $1 million to take the dog home from the movie, but he was turned down over safety concerns for the dog's safety. But maybe perhaps the most famous story to come out of this movie, um, which may or may not be true, and I'm going to preface this by saying there's a lot of debate about whether this actually happened or if this was just tall tales from the set. So the story goes that Steve Seagal likes to get very handsy with his stunt coordinators and his that's not all he likes to get handsy with sure and his uh his stunt men and all that and like he'll take liberties and actually hit them because he knows that they can't hit him back so he'll like just be an asshole and like really like you know give him a good chop every once in a while so it's like like in the wrestling tough enough the show remember it was what's his name was hit hitting everybody (laughs) actually chopping him hard yeah so so the guy who was like the stunt coordinator on the film was like, I don't know, talking about this hold that he was like, uh, they were talking about holds and he was talking about he has this really good sleeper hold that uh, that was effective. And Seagal was bragging, saying, there's no way anyone could choke me out and put me to sleep. It's impossible. I'll escape every time. And the guy goes, oh, yeah. And this guy, I forget his name. I think it's like something Gill. It's like Stephen Gill or something like yeah. that. He's like. Apparently, he's like a really like famous, you know, name in the uh, martial arts world. Like he's a respected guy. So Seagal was like, yeah, put it on me. There's no way. There's no way. I'll get out of it in two seconds. So the guy puts the hold on Seagal. Allegedly, this is all alleged. And like there's people, there's like witnesses or whatever. And so and he was put it he put it on him lightly, you know, and then Seagal kind of took it seriously and like tried to like hit him in the balls and like get out of it. And then the guy cinched it on tighter when Seagal started fighting him. And apparently Seagal got knocked out and crapped his pants because like, you know, when you're knocked out, like, you know, he went limp Uh, and his bowels went limp as well. Now this has been debated, denied by Seagal. People on set have claimed that it's true. The guy who put the sleeper hold on him also said it was true. Now he, now he, he has nothing to lose by just keeping this going, even if it is false. It but, reminds me, we joke about Kirby Enthusiasm, but that yeah. scene or the very famous storyline with Larry Dable, Larry David had a gerbil or a hamster up his ass. And yeah. it reminds me of that. Like, whether yeah, it's true or not, you yeah, don't know. Yeah, once it's out there, it's like it's hard to deny it, right? So what do you think? True or false? I, I think it's true. And, I think it's true, too. Honestly, totally true. I think it's true. But but it wouldn't surprise me if it's false, and here's why. Because if he's such a, a, a terror on the set, yeah, such a people bag. hate him. yeah. Then, of Why course, not? people will make that story up and keep it going because it's, you know, 80 people against one. And once you get that rumor out there, it's not going yeah, away. Yeah, it's over. It's, to me, he's a, he's, a, he's a pants pooper and, and, he's, and he's a sleeper. 
<laughs> I mean, and, and you know, maybe maybe this is a good segue into it, but this movie is written and shown oh. as if like he's a hero. And, and uh, look, I'm not going to say he's not For a hero sure. in the movie because he saves people and all that stuff. Yeah. But the weird like heroic acts, like the whole subplot of him saving this dog and just carting this dog around, it really had nothing to do with the movie. Yeah. It, yeah. The, it just was weird, right? It was out of place. The the dog being thrown out in a garbage bag on the street and him slamming on his brakes and rescuing it had nothing to do with the movie besides make him into a hero. Yeah. Like an, an extra reason why Gino Felino is a hero. It's, it's like, you know, if he had the dog and it wasn't a puppy and yeah. he rescued this dog and then the dog became part of the boss fight at the end where he's going to like help him. That yeah. would make sense to me. But the fact that he's just carrying the dog around, and it's like an accessory you know, to him. It screams of, it like, so that and the scene where the pimp is beating up the the hooker. In the, in the beginning. Yeah, in the beginning, the very beginning. Now, these first two acts take place in, like, the first, what, five minutes of the movie? So it's, like, pre-title cards and then, like, first thing after title cards, right? So it seems to me that he got, like, the first script like way yeah. back before shooting started and he goes, you know what? I need more of me looking really good. Right. <laughs> That's exactly what happened. Yeah. Right? And then, they, and then maybe he wrote them scenes in or he pressured the writers to say, Hey, I need more heroic scenes, especially early to establish how great a guy I am. I mean, I'm not going to complain because that, that the opening scene where he yeah. like busted up the, yeah. the, the, the fight and he ruined his own stakeout was actually oh, kind of a, a cool thing. And yeah. I like the way they did the opening credits too, because yeah. it was like, it was very 1991. Like they had all the credits and they paused on him too, which was yep. great. Paused on his face through the windshield of the guy that he put it through. I like that. Yeah. But like, it really, it really bugged me that like he ruined the stakeout. Like there was probably a really big fish in that warehouse that they were yeah. about to take down. And he could have arrested the pimp like 10 minutes later. <laughs> Like, sure I know. Have. Well, no, I know he the the girl was getting slapped around, and he wanted yeah. to stop it as soon as possible. And I totally get that. But like, you know, sometimes you gotta like, you know, you, you gotta bust the big fish, right? For all the other crimes that he himself committed in this movie, yeah. like that, letting her wait another ten minutes would have been okay, I think, yeah. because yeah. he was he, they were there, right? Yeah, or they, they could have like quietly got him. Yeah, they could have sent the other the other cops on the other side of the street to go get him and not bust the stakeout up. I don't know the if, there, if, there's a, if there's any kind of police activity outside of, of the, the warehouse where, where I would assume illegal activity is going on that they're staking out. It's going to throw red flags up to the, the, the criminals. Yeah, I mean, I, look, it's a lot of violence in this movie, but oh. I don't know how many deaths there were. Did you look this up? I did. Yeah, we got moviebodycounts.com, Drew. We're going to bust it out again. It's a site that exists. So I, I was curious, too. So I looked it up and I found that we had 20 20 total deaths. 20 total deaths. Now, 12 from our main character, Gino Felino, Steven Seagal, and only six for the bad guys. So the good guy doubles the bad guy's body counts. But where's the we other had, two then? And then we had two random deaths that, okay. uh, that are attributed to, like, you know, random thugs. Okay. All right. Yeah. It's, it's just, like, collateral damage. Yeah. But not collateral damage so much of just, like, I don't know. I guess maybe collateral damage is the right word. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But anyway, the the kills are spaced out. There were there were four scenes where just one person was killed, including you know our our uh, our main guy here, Bobby Lupo, which is sets in motion the entire story. Anybody know why he did Bobby yeah. Lupo? Yeah, and we got random people in the street because you know Richie Richie Madonna is, uh, is a psychopath. <laughs> is know? that that yeah. street kill? Is that the yeah. lady at the stoplight? That's yeah, like, Can lady you at the stoplight. We have seven in uh in in Gino's house, which he yeah. took out seven bad guys seven henchmen with a pump action shotgun that he didn't pump yeah six by gun one by thrown off the building yeah (laughs) so ridiculous yeah and then five at a party which one of them he shot a guy's entire leg off yeah which is a classic scene of my entire life like my uncle used to talk about that all the time and it watching that again was great and another and another where he just like kicked a guy into a brick wall and murdered him yeah like imagine imagine dying by kick a brick wall when that guy looked like the toughest guy in the whole movie, too, he had the sweetest mullet. He yeah. had the biggest muscles. True. Yeah. Don't let a jean jacket vest <laughs> trick you into thinking he's a tough guy. I'm pretty sure that dude was in Roadhouse, too. Like, I feel yeah. like he was one of the bouncers in Roadhouse. Yeah. I have to yeah. look that up later. It's possible. Totally possible. L- let's talk about the man of the hour. Gino? Gino. 
don't call me Gino <laughs> Felino. Gino Felino? <laughs> <laughs> Gino Felino. I mean, like, listen, like between the name, between the knit sweater vest with no shirt underneath <laughs> it, between the double like religious like yeah. gold chain. Yeah. The we beret. Gotta, we got to talk about what the fuck he's wearing, Drew. Like with some random to. patch that he had on there. Like, listen, just you can't even talk about this guy without his 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 style. Like, what the hell is he wearing? And did he pick that out? Like, I'm talking Steven Seagal. Yeah, so I don't know what that vest is. I've never seen that vest out in the wild in my like life. like one that you put over a dress shirt. Yeah, like, I don't, yeah, I don't know. I, does, I don't know. It looks odd for that, too. But all that aside, that beret or whatever the hell, that hat with whatever symbols on, probably some military symbol, there's, you can't, you can't talk me out of me thinking that he insisted on wearing that. <laughs> the director was trying to get that hat off of his head, saying, listen, Steve, it doesn't really fit. It doesn't read. It doesn't read. You're just a cop in New York. <laughs> There's nothing in the story that says you're ex-military or whatever. Steve, please, can you just, we don't, you know, the hat looks great, but it just doesn't fit in the movie. And Seagal goes, no, nah, I think I'm going to keep the hat. <laughs> <laughs> and then they couldn't take the hat off of him, so he just decided to wear it. And he randomly wears it too. Yeah. It's like he wears it in the beginning. He yeah. wear, he, but he's not wearing it when he's at the stakeout. But then he wears it when he's walking on the street. <laughs> and then he's not wearing it at his house. And then he wears it at the end. It makes yeah. no sense. It's like randomly on. It's like he just yeah. had that in his closet. He's like, "This look really cool. I gotta wear it looks this really hat. Cool. I gotta wear this hat." You know? It makes no sense. Yeah. And and no joke. That sweater vest. I was looking at that. I'm like. This looks hot. Like, I know he has no shirt underneath it. Yeah. But it's like if you took a random vest and just put it on without anything underneath. And and honestly, like, he's not in that great a shape. He's not like that ripped. You yeah. know, he's not like right. a bodybuilder. He's not Schwarzenegger. He's not Van Damme here. He's just like an average yeah. build kind of guy. He's kind of wearing like a wrestler's outfit. It, it it's, does. It's the type of vest like like Stone Cold used to come out to a, to a vest with no shirt on underneath. And that but made, it, like... It he makes has sense like a in Mr. That, Rogers yeah, vest, though. It's it makes like, sense in that world. Stone in the Cold, wrestling world, it makes sense. But Stone Cold had yeah. like a leather vest. It yeah. was like a biker vest. It's like a biker like, vest. This yeah. is like you go to like, I it's don't know, JC yeah. Penny and you it get It was like, like a waiter's vest. <laughs> like if that. It was like, yeah. It looked like yeah. a grandpa's vest, yeah. you know? <laughs> <laughs> it's like ridiculous. And like, Maybe that know, was so, his grandpa's, yeah. you know, war, war hat. Oh, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> and war and vest. I don't it's know. From the thirty minutes they cut, yeah. man, they got yeah. they got they cut yeah. it out. Yeah. <laughs> but you, isn't that more disrespectful? You wear your like your grandpa's like war clothes. <laughs> He's like an <laughs> imposter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, you keep them. You don't wear them. <laughs> Imagine, imagine your your grandfather's like this decorated war veteran. He has this very nice suit, and you have it's it in your like house, and you just up. you throw it on and put it outside. It's something Seagal would do. It's what you would do that. What a scumbag! He's playing. He's playing dress up. Like, come on! I'm crying here, man. I'm uh, crying. It's like it's like four a.m., man. Oh my god. It's ridiculous. But yeah. uh, anyway, like... But it's so, not even Gino. It's not even Gino. We're still talking about Seagal here. Steven like, Seagal. Seagal is demanding he's wearing this hat and vest. There's, it, there's it, no it, other way. This was the, did not come from wardrobe. And and look, I don't mean to spend 25 minutes on Gino Felino here, but there's there's some more stuff here. We got we got the uh, we got another alert. I gotta get so, we gotta get some kind of sound effect. If I could play the motorcycle clip yeah. right now on a soundboard, I would play it. We got a bad father alert. Bad, <laughs> bad father alert. Possible bad husband alert. Tell well, me def- about this. Definitely bad husband alert. So, when we first see Seagal as a family man and a father, uh, he's, you know, his kid's doing his homework and his kid goes, Dad, can we play some baseball? He's like, yeah, man, get the bat, get, you know, get the ball, get the bat. First of all, I don't think Steven Seagal knows how to throw a baseball. No. I, I bet you he has no idea how to throw a ball. He'd be the um, guy that throws out the first yeah. pitch and it, and it doesn't even make it. Yeah, it doesn't make it, right? So, they're walking, about to walk outside to go play some ball. Gets the phone call. Now, he could have let that phone call go because he's on sun time. That's what he should have did. Right, Drew? Yeah, he absolutely. Takes the phone call and obviously partner's dead. You got to come down here now, which I get. You blow off the baseball point with the sun because your partner just died. It's a big thing. But I say he should never have picked that phone up. No, right? I agree. He's on the way out. It could if have been a, a telemarketer. Yeah, it's 91. Yeah, yeah exactly. You're, if you're a separated father of this kid and it's your time with your son, 
He probably sees them once a week, if that. Yeah. Maybe maybe once every two weekends, right? You need to be spending time with the kid, especially at that age. Or let you know, the answering kids, like, machine pick kids up. Probably like call. eight years old, nine years old, if yeah. that. He, he should have screened yeah. the call with the answering yeah. machine. Get the tape out. Yeah. You know, so, listen so, to it. So bad dad alert for sure. The bad husband too. You said. Yeah. He's just trying to get out of baseball because he sucks at baseball. That's my. That's, a, that's my. That's opinion. true. You know? What makes him a bad husband? Did they yeah. say? I don't know. So, uh, so they're going through a divorce. He and his wife. So he doesn't want to though. She wants to. She That's wants the way it. I got it's it. It's probably. Do you think it's typical cop works too much? Probably is, is his love with the job kind of thing. I mean, clearly he, he left yeah. his kid. Uh, you know, yeah. the kid was so disappointed he, he couldn't play baseball yeah. with his dad. So I mean, this still kind of stuff happens all the time. You know. So when when he he called her right away after he learned his co- his, his friend died and said, "Hey, you know, I'm gonna you're gonna take this boy back. I can't I can't bring him to a murder scene. Yeah. You know. At least yeah, he didn't bring him to the murder did. scene." Well, that, he gets a point yeah. on that one. Yeah. Did you? He did have a katana just sitting out. Like, yeah. did you just see that? Yeah. It's, and that kid's living there. You know, kid could easily pick that katana up and chop, exactly. his, own, chop his own hand off. Uh, maybe she. Maybe she's divorcing him because of the hat. You know, and the yeah. outfit. Like, he's maybe just she's, into she's the embarrassed. Style. She's just embarrassed. <laughs> she's not into that yeah. anymore. But like, not to like jump around to the end of the movie, but like. She asks for him back at the end of the movie. Again, ties back yeah. to him looking like a hero. Yeah. It's Steven Seagal and, trying to look and, like a hero. Yeah. And like, if you notice, Drew, and listeners, he didn't even beg for her back to no. take him back. She just brought it up. Let's, let's do this. Let's go but all in. What did he do to deserve her back? He didn't Nothing. do anything. All he, all he did was his partner died. That's he all He solved happened. the case. Did, that was, was it. Is she going to mercy remarry him because his partner died? That it makes zero sense. Yeah. There was no, and there it, was nothing yeah. to it. So so that was before there was the house break in and he killed seven guys in their home. Do you think that she like changed her mind after the seven murder spree? <laughs> like, hey, maybe we, I need some protection here. Yeah. <laughs> I don't no, anybody. <laughs> no, not not the protection, but to say like, all right, like I can't, like I really don't want to marry this guy. Like I really don't want to be married to this guy anymore. If he's just going to be murdering people in our yeah. home. <laughs> True. <laughs> if he's it's gonna ridiculous. bring, if he's gonna bring the mafioso guys into our home, like this is dangerous. I mean, he look, he's got a, he's got a checkered past here. I'll say that. Yeah. I use that word a lot here. Yeah. But you know, he is there anything else you want to say on the bad father stuff? Because I think no, we need to talk about on. him as let's a cop. Like, yep. so he's a detective, and that's his rank. He's got this patch that he gave himself on his hat, whatever it is, right? I don't know what level <laughs> his he grandfather's, is. His grandfather's <laughs> patch. His grandfather's yeah. patch. He's wearing his grandfather's war, war clothes, you know, playing dress up. But he, he's a detective and you find this out. I want to ask you, is he actually a good cop? Do you no. think he's a good cop? Well, I mean, like, no, because he's a, a vigilante, <laughs> right? He's yeah, he's a vigilante. Paul Kersey. Yeah. Like, now you could make the case, like... Do you need to be a vigilante to catch a guy like Richie Marone or whatever the hell his name is? Yeah, I don't think so. I mean, this guy was going to get caught eventually, right? He had a death He wish was himself. killing people in broad daylight. <laughs> he knew what he was getting Not himself hard into. to find. Yeah. I mean, look, he's he's he blows that stake out of the beginning. I mean, that's just clearly, I yeah. don't think he's going to survive long as a cop there. It was, you know, it was, it was heroic, but also very unprofessional. I, I li- we listed out all of the things that he does in this movie. And I think he's a dirty cop. I personally think he's a dirty cop because there's no way uh-huh. that you could do a lot of the stuff that he says that he does and yeah. not be a dirty cop. Right. Yeah. So let's go through the list. The first one, he throws a pimp through a car window. Yeah. What do you police, call that? Police brutality. All right. So he he had the guy arrested up against the wall, about to cuff him. The guy made a throwaway comment about his wife, and then he threw him through a car window. Yeah. <laughs> the like, throwaway comment was pretty. Now the pretty guy weird. the guy was just beating on a hooker. So like yeah yeah he I'm not I don't feel bad for the guy, <laughs> but it's still police brutality. Kind of deserved it. Kind of yeah. deserved it. Yeah. He's he's hanging out with the mafia. Like, yeah. like hanging out, like deeply involved. Like now, sitting there's more down, going on there. Sitting down at the table, yeah. and they're they are showing them a lo- him a lot of respect to the point uh, where something's going on there, right? It's 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 way weird. Now he maybe yeah. wrote himself in there to look respectful, like the mafia bosses surprise, uh, like love him. But there was a lot of it was a sit down with the boss. Yeah. yeah, at the very least, it's criminal conspiracy because. Even if he doesn't like wet his beak, you know, and get yeah. the money to take the money and do dirty things, he looks the other way. At the very least, he looks the other way. Well, it's his neighborhood, you know. Yeah. You gotta, I guess yeah. it's like, you know, it's like 
going deer hunting, like population sure. control, right? Sure. <laughs> it's like it's a, it's a business. Yep. He he busts into Richie's brother's bar and busts everybody up. I mean, we'll talk about that in a minute. He but destroys that business, Drew. What do you what do you write him up for? Oh, well, you know, it's clearly it's trespassing and assault because the bar isn't open to the public and he gets in there. Starts knocking around people with boxing, blah, 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 you know, Drew, and all that stuff. <laughs> the uh, cue ball? Yeah, <laughs> with a cue ball. Destruction of property, terroristic threats, and a complete butchering of an Italian New York accent. Yeah, <laughs> that's his biggest crime yeah, of the whole movie. Crime. Yeah. Like, the 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 other one, the assault at the strip club. It was sort of a strip club, or maybe it was more like a... It was know. sort of like a tilted kilt kind of place. Yeah, like a gentleman's, a gentleman's established. It was a high end, high end Hooters. <laughs> they had the, they had the, the yeah. uh, do, they, do they sell? Do they still sell chicken wings there the at, this high end, end? <laughs> at this high end Hooters? <laughs> well, yeah. it makes it classy because they had a bow tie, yeah. right? Yeah. Or the the yeah. like the tuxedo tie. Yeah, like I don't know. There's a word for that. I don't know. Like a like a playboy a club, but like it was like, like they had like a playmate. Playboy bunny outfit kind of thing. It, it was like Chippendales, but yeah, for like the for, female for Chippendales. Yes. <laughs> yeah. It's, I don't know what. What do you, would you call that ranks. female Chippendales? I don't know. I I don't know. I don't know where that ranks in terms of yeah. like classiness either. But he he throws the guy down the stairs. <laughs> like, <laughs> what is that? Yeah. Uh, a throw is a word. I I I think he dumped him down. He the stairs. clotheslined him. He dumped him. Yeah. <laughs> guy clearly landed on his head. He's probably he dumped dead. The body. He they didn't count body. it in moviebodycounts.com, but I think the guy died. <laughs> Maybe that's or, one of the off-screen or, deaths. At the very least, broken neck and paralyzed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he arrests Gina Gershon for, quote, prostitution. Wrongful arrest. She's not a prostitute. <laughs> So he like just planting he, evidence. He, just, he planted. He just wanted to get her into the station. Yeah, and then the other guys, they were co-conspirators because he's like, "Oh, you see her down on the corner." He's like, "Yeah, every yeah. night, yeah. every night." Yeah. He's he has no warrants for any yeah. of the, the Every, trespassing yeah. he's doing. Everywhere he's going, no warrants, zero he, warrants. He breaks into his partner's yeah. desk. He yeah. steals evidence that he didn't report. So he found that his partner was kind of dirty. He found cocaine. He found twenty grand. He found sex pictures and <laughs> sex pictures. Yeah, didn't report any of this to his superiors. <laughs> tampering with evidence, but withholding evidence. <sighs> Dude, I have a lot to say about those sex <laughs> pictures. I just the Polaroids, yeah, the Polaroids. It's a, it's a topic in itself. It's, it's a good and yeah. the, the the other biggest crime besides <laughs> the butchering of the New York accent, true, is <laughs> this <many>? car. <sighs> What were you gonna say? Uh, we'll get we'll get to it later. <laughs> oh my god, we're already on the car, and so 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 you listeners know Drew was watching this movie earlier today, and he thought it was so funny <laughs> that Seagal took this route where he went under the sub like the the train where it was like super bumpy, and he was, just he completely ruined the shocks on his on his car. What, what and, do they and, call those? Uh, like when there are people riding bikes, it's like moguls yeah, or something. Yeah, like, I don't know. Skiing? But Drew thought it was so funny. He he sent me a video of himself watching the scene and giggling, <laughs> which I thought was extra hilarious. Dude. Like, and I agree. I'm not going to lie to you. It was stupid. I laughed so <laughs> hard watching some of the scenes in this movie. Yeah. Because, like, I don't know, this movie was just a palate cleanser for me. Yeah. Like, not that I didn't like watching Three Ninjas. Not that I didn't like watching a lot of the other movies that we watched. But, like, this, this movie is, like, coming home, yeah. you know, after a long so, trip. Yeah, can I ask you, we obviously weren't, this wasn't in our warehouse in 91. We were too no. young to watch this, like in 91. I watched 91. it a little older. Yeah, right. So is it supposed to be funny? I I, I don't know because, you know, and I'm going to say this, right? Like yeah. I used to joke about this and you used to say old man yells at cloud, right? They don't yeah. make them like they used to. Yeah. You can't make this movie no. today. You can't because the closest you could say like, is like John Wick, but it's not. It's yeah. not. But like the tone of the movie, it's not funny. It, but no, it's, it's not. clearly hilarious. <laughs> but I think it's it's funny in the way that like, you know, the eighties, like now people have this like obsession with the eighties when yeah. in the nineties, the eighties were like lame, I guess. Mm. But like these movies I, but, but I don't know how you don't but, watch this and but, laugh. I feel like even like the fight scenes when they're super serious, but they almost in retrospect, play like Jackie Chan scenes. It, it is. In a way. Where it's funny. Like, <laughs> With the him, him beating everyone up is hilarious. <laughs> and I don't think it's, like, shot to be funny. Whereas no, Jackie th- Chan scenes are definitely shot to be funny. I think maybe it's because because so much time has passed and it doesn't age well because it's very dated. 
but it's but it's yeah. not dated because oh, no. yeah it's, i don't it's know weird. They, it's weird like think about taken right go back yeah. to taken yeah not any of the sequels but the original taken that was kind of badass but if you wait 20 30 years is that going to look comical Maybe. i don't but know like, but it, that no was matter, a serious tone no matter how you slice it this car just like jumping over these bumps and like it's not even a, a, a tactical advantage to take that no. route. He didn't gain any ground on, on the bad guy it was taking this route. It was actually slower. Yeah. And, and he drives this car for the rest of the movie, and he yeah. doesn't take it to any type of shop at all. <laughs> yes. and, and the best part is, like, with the whole scene, they're showing him. I'm, I'll po- Maybe I should post a video like, of me giggling to so, Instagram for everybody. Just uh, if, For those of you that haven't seen the movie and maybe won't even watch the movie and are just listening to us, imagine getting in a car chase. And the guy is like taking one route, which is a straight road. And then you try to take a shortcut by going on a road that's full of speed bumps. Yeah, it's <laughs> that's exactly what he did. He, he took drove the, like yeah, Seagal took, the, speed Seagal took the speed bump route and like <laughs> a surprise. He didn't catch him. He didn't catch a bad Dude. guy. And the, and the best part about it was they kept showing him in the car. Like, and he was, like <laughs> his head was, was bouncing on the top of the car roof. It was like he was on one of those, like, what do you call them? The bulls at, at the bar? Yeah. Like yeah. the bucking bronco yeah, yeah, type yeah. thing? He looked like a bull rider. Yeah. It was ridiculous. Yeah. And it just made no sense at all. <laughs> and that, that's one of the biggest crimes of the movie. Yeah. But I want to dig more into his mafia ties. Like, what do you think the backstory is with this? I don't know. See, this is where I wonder if, like, that 30 minutes of lost footage, you know, you cowards, show us the Seagal cut, you know, that we can see maybe there's a little bit more backstory to this. Because, like, we get, like, a little bit of a glimpse of, like, Seagal had ties with Richie's father as a kid yeah. growing up. But Richie's Junior father, Soprano. yeah, who was Junior Soprano. But Richie's father wasn't in the mafia. And then he, it just doesn't make sense, Drew. I can't make heads or tails of it. How, like, the mafia respects him so much, but also he's a clean cop. Yeah, he's a clean cop, unlike his his partner. But it's weird because, you're right, they show him so much respect. He's involved with a lot of these guys. Now, when I read on Wikipedia, maybe this was a little speculation, but they said that Richie and him had this rivalry growing up with him and him and Bobby. Yeah. And and maybe Richie went down this bad path or whatever. Yeah. And it, I don't know. It just makes no sense because well, yeah. it seems like he's part of the mafia in a way or he's on the take. It's very, yeah. very weird. It's, maybe it's like there's a, there's a quote in the beginning of the movie that talks about like all oh, neighborhood and how Brooklyn is this community that like it's very tight knit. So maybe it's the type of thing where you have three different three different eggs here. You have. Yeah. So you have Gino, you have Richie and you have Bobby. So Richie went the full-on criminal route. Yeah. He's like long Full gone. Blown. He's foregone, right? So he's in the mafia. Or like, you know, he's like a, I don't know, uh, like a like a four-hire mafia guy. He's not he like, seemed like a the, hitman. Yeah, he's not in the family, right? So then you have Bobby, who gets a taste of the, of the bad side, but went to be a cop. So like dirty cop, so he does some good, but a lot of bad also. And then you have Gino, who's white knight, right? Yeah. So maybe that's where it is. But throughout all of it, all of them seem to respect community, you know. It's, it's weird, And that's though, where Seagal respects community, even though there's some mafia. It's just weird because they, they're they cool with him, and he's a clean cop. And normally yeah. they wouldn't want to be seen with that because yeah. anything they talk about, he's yeah. got evidence yeah. on them. And if he is a clean cop, you would think that he would want to find the crimes. Right, right. Right. So, it's just weird. And, and, and if he's using this excuse of community to turn a blind eye to the mafia, which he clearly knows more than your average person about because he's having sit downs with them. He's speaking Italian. Them. Yeah, he's speaking Italian to a Don. <laughs> Talking the old language. Yeah, that he's not clean. He's flat out that there's there's no way. Like one one plus one does not equal three. Worse like what if like an internal affairs guy had like the long lens and they're like yeah. watching him sit down with the mafia guys. It makes yeah. no sense. Yeah. And the, the original title of the movie was something else. I forgot what it was. And Warner Brothers said no, but it was something about blood. It had, it had blood in the title and they probably yeah. nixed it. They probably it was nixed about it like, yeah. you know, spilling blood. Yeah. Let, let's talk about Bobby. You mentioned him, right? Let's talk about Bobby. Let's and his talk murder. about Bobby Lupo. Bobby Lupo. Anybody know why they did Bobby Lupo? And you know, the whole point of this movie is centered around the murder of Bobby Lupo. Walk me through what happens here because it's a pretty brutal scene. Yeah. So Bobby, you know, is having a nice stroll, probably a Sunday morning. And that's another thing. You don't murder people on Sundays. It's, it's just a, not. You don't. Come daylight. On. Yeah. 
at the market. Yeah. It's like, let, let people have a nice Sunday. <laughs> so he's, he's, he's walking down the street with his family. He's got, you know, his wife and his two kids stopping at the fruit stand. And all of a sudden, this maniac, Richie, comes out of his car and just fires six shots into his chest. Throws down a Polaroid. We don't see the Polaroid. We just, what, what's on the Polaroid? We just yeah. see the photo. And he spits on him. And then just walks away. Fires a gun, fires a shot at him as he walks away, which is kind of his calling card. But yeah, what what, what did you think of of Bobby's acting? Uh, the, the actor of Bobby as he was <laughs> yeah. dying after he got shot twelve times. Also com- comedic. It's like this is like in a comedy skit. Like you think of it like in a in a Key and Peel skit or something, dude. Where a guy gets shot a hundred times and is still somehow kind of still alive. I laughed so hard, <laughs> <laughs> like so hard. When he shot him and he was just flailing yeah. and it was so fake and so ridiculous and he shot him so many times and he was still talking. Like, <laughs> how is he alive? And then the the the, the last shot, he pulled a Raymond Kalitri on him and he, yeah. he, he just shot him as he was walking away. Like, what, just one for good measure, just in case. Yeah. It was like the ultimate disrespect. Like, I got one bullet left. Here you go. Boom. Yeah. So, yeah. So, like, who is this person that would just, like, fire upon you? Cold and cold blood in the middle of the street with a hundred witnesses. Like, be some you gotta be psych- crazy. You gotta be some kind of psychopath, right? Well, and you and you said it right. And this is a good transition into Richie. You said he walked out of his car. Like he walked out of his car like two blocks over. Yeah. Like he walked, yeah, very far with his trench coat and just pulls yeah. this gun and, out and starts shooting. And he was in no hurry to escape either. Exactly. Not only exactly. that, he killed a civilian on the way out. Exactly. Just for honking, yeah. for honking a horn at Just him. because she said, hey, move your car. Yeah. And he walks up to her and yeah. he did it slowly too. It wasn't even yeah. like, hey, let me just, you know, that was premeditated. You talk about, it wasn't in rage. It yeah. was premeditated. Yeah. So this guy is clearly like, does not care about his safety or the safety of others. It's almost like, it's almost like a suicide mission, I would say, right? Yeah. And, and that's really the thing with this guy. Like, because as I was watching this and as the movie unfolded, I kept thinking, Man, this guy's a badass. Like this yeah. guy's this guy's crazy. Yeah. But the more I realized, the more I realized like he was just in it. He had a death wish of yeah. his own. It's like imagine if a, a cold-blooded bastard murderer knows that he only has 24 hours to live. Yeah. So But what I don't understand is why his crew was hanging with him the whole time. And we gotta talk about that yeah. because I mean, yeah. it, uh-huh. it's a big piece. Hashtag we'll, the, yeah. Hashtag we'll get to that later, like as because it'll be part of our villain scale. Yeah, but this is the reason well, like, for everything, yeah. right? Like, yeah, get into what, it. what happened? Like, this picture that was thrown on there. Yeah, that's that's the reason for the murder. And the reason why this guy became unhinged, you know, what could possibly do that, Drew? And the only answer is love. Sex picks. Yeah, lo- love and sex picks. Love and sex picks. So, we find out that Bobby Lupo is having extramarital relations with Richie's girlfriend. Double, you right? Two, yeah. two of them. You don't, you don't go doing that to some crazy crime boss, mafia tied guy, right? Because you know you're going to get your comeuppance. Exactly. And, and you, he documented uh, it with yeah, photographs. Not, exactly. If you're going to do that, you don't take pictures of it, Drew. Who? So who? I need to, uh, let's so, dive into these pictures. Th- there's gotta, two things. There's two things. Before we get into like the yeah. pictures themselves, what kind of an idiot not only documents his affair while married, you know, to like, because the wife will eventually see it. Like, why would you do that? Why would you videotape yourself? Why would you take pictures of yourself of adu- of adultery? And two, why would you take pictures of yourself if the person you're cheating on with is the girlfriend of a psychopath, you know, criminal? Like mafia hitman. Yeah. It's it- this guy's, this guy's decision making is just beyond. And listen, I look. I I would say I would post these pictures to Instagram, but our account will get get banned. But the pictures themselves are absolutely ridiculous. Like he's posing, <laughs> yeah. Like like someone told him, like say cheese. <laughs> yeah, like, like it's very comical. Yeah. He, he, you know, without getting into all the details, he's he's not in front of her. If is what I'll say, and yeah. he's he's you know whatever, right? And he's smiling <laughs> like somebody's <laughs> yeah. cheese. Yeah. So there is a person, like, we do find out there's a reason why these pictures, like, even logistically could exist, is there was a third person in the room. And it's just, like, a, an extra waitress who worked with the other girl. So it's not like a... So, and, and she's neither here nor there. But, like, I was thinking, 
Do you think Polaroid sex pics were a, are like a thing? I, back in 91? Because the Polaroid is a very clunky device, if you remember that, Polaroid cameras. Maybe it's the equivalent of the cell phone pic at the time, because yeah. it's like, you're not going to get out your like SLR and get your lenses, right? Like, if yeah. you want a quick pic, yeah. get your Polaroid you snap there. It. You snap it. And then you can give it to yeah. them right away. Yeah, and there's no like digital footprint or... Take it to the printers. Like the, the negatives. Co- you don't go to the Kodak station and then like <laughs> that person could make dupes and like dis- distribute it somewhere. I guess that's how you have to do it. Otherwise, yeah. you need your own dark room. So the Polaroid is like your own fail safe. There's one copy of this and that's it. But not in this movie. They had like 30 pictures and it looked yeah. they were all the he same took, pose. Like they his took wife so had so many pictures. Why did like, they take so many? <laughs> just take one. I don't know. Take it just, one. It just seems funny to me. Like, you know, if you're like, you know, for lack of a better word, in the middle of the act and like you go. And it's like a whole like, doesn't it like take you, out, then, of the, you, it take it? you out of the mood? Yeah. Because it's like it's a contraption like, for lack of a better word. The Polaroid camera is a contraption. Exactly. And yeah. and the amount of pictures that they took, it <laughs> yeah. wasn't just one. Yeah. It was like 20. Yeah. There was a reloading. There was a reloading of film going on yeah. here. They had a, they had a reloaded tray here. Like, hold yeah. on a second. Yeah, yeah. Don't, don't, don't. Hold on. Hold on. Stop <laughs> for a minute. Let me reload yeah. this. It makes no yeah. sense. Yeah, no. So, so Richie basically, and we find out, right? Richie murders him because of this. You yeah. mentioned it, right? And he also murdered the other girl. Because the girl that he, that that Bobby yeah, was cheating his girlfriend, on, his girlfriend, yes, and we find out she died first. Yes, I want to dive into Richie a little bit more before we dive into the villain scale. Yes, what kind of kid was this guy like growing up? Because we found out they all grew up together. Like, what was this kid? So, is he one of those like torturing animals? Kind of like I think he you was. Know? That kind of level. Like where, the butterfly effect yeah. where the kid's like where like so, in the box. So he has a little brother in this movie as well, Vinny. And then if Gino was hanging out with him as well, and like, you know, Gino was also, you know, a very close friend of the family, as we know from the father. Do you think like they were friends, like really good friends until like around 13, 14, 15? Yeah. And then and then, and then Richie started acting a little bit apart. stranger. Yeah. Kind of get into some sick stuff. Maybe start showing them some of these, like, hey, I found this bootleg horror movie where, yeah. oh, this may or may not be a river. I've happened, you know? Yeah. Like, I don't want to watch this. This is too hard. Or, like, hey, check this out. Let's go to this back alley. I found this cat. And he starts, like, kicking the cat or something like yeah. that. And, like, dude, that's not cool. And they, and he's laughing the whole time. Do like, you, you think, think this is the kind of kid friends? we're talking about? I, I mean, I think so. I mean, do you think they were actually friends? I don't know. It's yeah. like they said that they were. I mean, him and his brother seemed kind of close, but. Yeah. He seemed more like, well, he was definitely tougher than his brother, obviously, right? For sure, As we yeah. find out. Bigger, the, big, yeah, bigger in, in size and stature and criminal uh, thirst. Did his brother work for him or was he just associated? Like, were they laundering money through that bar? Like, what was going on there? I, I, I didn't think really it, get Yeah, it. I don't know if his brother owned the bar or not. I feel like maybe he, maybe he did. Like, I feel like the brother was less connected to the mafia than his older brother was. I, so, I would agree with that. Yeah. I think the I think the younger brother was kind of not I wouldn't say working for the older brother, but like he definitely like like maybe he like didn't know what to do. And the older yeah. brother always like, you know, guided him. Posted him up here, here's yeah. a job for you. Yeah, Keep here's a job here, do this. Yeah. But like ultimately didn't respect him. I, I think the whole thing with him on this death wish, and we didn't really talk too much about it, but it's just weird because he's on crack. And they make yeah. it. Oh yeah. And I don't know. Look, I've never done crack. You've never done. I don't done. know what crack fueled psychosis never, you, wait, looks wait, 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 wait. like. You've never done crack. <laughs> I'm not cool That's, enough. Everyone's done crack. <laughs> I mean, he's on like some type of coke, crack psychosis. Yeah. And like they, every other seed is him on the pipe. For and real. It, it's it's like as much of a caricature of coke and crack. As Jesse Spano's caffeine pills yeah. from Stay by the Bell. It's fair. It's fair. Like it was Reefer Madness, you know, style. And it it was just weird. Like he went berserk. Now I don't know if this is what actually happens so, to people, but I, it seemed I don't know. over the top. So, so you know, like when like in the movie The Mask. Yes. You put the mask on and it like it it takes your is it your id or your ego or whatever yeah. you call it? Like it takes the you that's really inside of you and, and magnifies it. When Jim Carrey put it on, he became like kind of a sexual predator, but like kind of a funny <laughs> one. 
And it was laughable. It's whatever. Right. And then, but when Dorian Gray put it on, you take a, a psycho murderer and turns into a supervillain, yeah, right? He was a supervillain. So maybe that the mask is like code for crack. That's true. And then it the crack be. not doesn't turn everyone into a murderer, but turns Richie into a yeah. crazy, you know, mur- binge murderer, if, if you were, if, for yeah. lack of a better term. It just seemed like a caricature of it to yeah. me. It was yeah. so over the It's the, the mask. Top. It's it the was mask. very much the mask. I think you yeah. nailed that. Yeah, thank you. We can't talk that. we can't talk about the brother though without talking about this bar fight. I know Dude, and we gotta mention gonna, it. Yeah. And while we're talking about the bar fight, I just gotta say the brother is the most sympathetic figure of this movie. <laughs> I feel so bad for this guy. Why well, why? Tell me this why. This poor guy. Because as we said before, he's probably just, you know, he doesn't know what's he doesn't know what to do. Like he wants to be it like in crime, but like he doesn't know how to do crime. <laughs> he and he, he yeah. do crime. And, and he's like and he's not tough at all. Like he he wants to be tough, but he's not tough at all. He's you got didn't the see back hair. You didn't see him fighting Gino in the bar when he came in and he smashed his entire bar around. No, he, he had the, he had the piece and what did he say yeah. to him? He, he called him out. He said, "You're gonna let him make yeah. you or whatever yeah, you he had, said." You had the chrome and you didn't do anything. You let him. You let him take you. Get the piece. Yeah, and he he got roughed up so hard, so hard. I mean, I I want to ask you about the bar fight just in general, right? Because this whole scene seemed improvised, didn't it? Yeah, like Seagal talking smack and all that. Yeah, it definitely did. It definitely seemed like Seagal was in that bar. He's in that. He's in that set, and he just looked around the room at what was in there and used it to like talk smack before the fighting happened. I feel That's like John like. Flynn told him go in there and just rough him up. Yeah. You know, just rough him up. Like he's yeah. walking behind the bar, smashing all the glasses. He's like, whose hot dog is this? Is your hot yeah. dog? Yeah. Like, who, that, like that made me that laugh is, so hard. Yeah, that is not in the script. Whose hot dog is this? But, <laughs> but that's also giving Seagal credit, you know? Like, yeah. Are you are you willing to give him credit for, for being able to improvise? I no, I'm not. I'm not. I don't know. That that who knows. He used all of his powers like on the accent. Like he yeah. couldn't he couldn't yeah. <laughs> on the poorly Dude, done accent. His Italian New York accent <laughs> is offensive. <laughs> I mean it kind of is. Yeah. What where do you so Bar fight is one of the most iconic Seagal scenes it's a great of scene. all of them. It really is. Like the whole pool ball piece. Like, I mean, you you mentioned it before the show. Yeah. Like that was just a great touch. So yeah, there's there's not a lot of like cinematic redeemability to this movie, but like when he like is walking around that bar and questioning people and kind of like like puffing his chest out, he picks up a pool cue relatively early, or a pull up the the cue ball. And he's just like bouncing it on the ground every once in a while. And every crack is like very noticeable. And it's like it's building tension. These guys know that every time that ball cracks on the ground, he's going to hit somebody with this ball soon. <laughs> I, thought he was, he, I thought he going to throw it. Honestly, yeah, I thought he was going to throw it. But even but smarter than throwing it, what does he do? Like he takes like a little like towel like and like almost kind of discreetly like wraps it up in a towel <laughs> to like use as like the world's most painful uh i don't know you what you turn, call you turn those into things a mace slapjack yeah like, you know like they call it a slapjack or something <laughs> yeah that like is used black in the jack. mafia it's a, a black jack. jack is it a black yeah, jack yeah, okay yeah, yeah. okay there you go yeah dude oh the my cracks God. the cracks that he's oh it's just the, it's the sound there. guy should have won an oscar dude it's up there with, you know, i'm gonna rank it next to the department store fight yeah. From Mark for Death, when he drives the car into, <laughs> into the department store and the bone snaps. Yeah. I think we counted them on the, the old amount episode. of bone snaps in that department store. Yeah. It's similar to the cracks of the queue. He knocks the guy's tooth out. Like the the vis the, the, the visceral scene of like the him smacking the, the mullet dude teeth. In the, the mole dude in the face and he's spitting teeth out on the pool table. <laughs> it's a great touch. I mean, I mean and then the, the audacity for Steven Seagal. To to add this guy in the stick man stick about man. the guy who trained Bruce Lee apparently on on cer- certain martial arts he's a friend of Bruce Lee's like the the stick fighting in this was just him swinging his arms yes yeah, yeah so it, like there's they, they would like flip cameras of like him waving his arms holding two pool cues then the stick man holding two pool cues I just imagine they're like flailing in the air nowhere near each other but like with cameras it makes it look closer and then the, and then the offset is like a guy just going crack 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 yeah. crack like it's making like snapping stuff yeah making the sounds what about those 4th of July things you had at your house where you yeah. drop them on the ground those little those like snappers pavement yeah. snappers that's what that's... That, there's somebody just chucking snappers to make exactly. it seem like they were they were jousting each other <laughs> 
Oh man! Well, look, it's time. We gotta we gotta bust it out. All right, let's. I, let's, I, I'm let's very wrap this curious up by about scale of this dude. Where he's gonna go? Villain scale time. If you're new to the show, we got four categories: look and style, hideout and layer, plan, and henchman. All one to five, total out of twenty. What is this guy gonna do, man? Yeah, I don't know. Like, I, I have no idea where this is gonna go either because I haven't really thought about it too much, to be honest with you. It's kind of like we're gonna have to like figure this out as we go. We'll, we'll, we'll wing it. Like his yeah. look and style, because I have some thoughts. I can I, I can start too. this one. Me too. Go I'll for start it. it. Yeah, I think his look was pretty weak. He, he really? didn't really have a good outfit. I disagree, but go he, on. I didn't like the wispy mustache. Okay. He didn't look like he was in the mafia to me. He just looked like no. like a guy. Right. He looked like a guy. That's it. Yep. He, he had no menacing look to me. No, uh, I I agree that he didn't really look mafia esque. Like he didn't really have like the nice suit on. I think the mustache worked. He slicked back hair. Looked like a piece of shit for <laughs> sure. Um, he didn't used to be. He is. Yeah. I, I consider the crack pipe as yeah, part of his look and style, right, too. That's an accessory. Added, added to it. Nice accessory. <laughs> I don't know. I, I liked his gun of choice, which was kind of like a snub nose revolver. Yeah, yeah. That's kind of a bad guy gun. Yeah. You know? <sighs> what did you give him? I, I would give him a one. I didn't even score it. I'm really? giving him a one. Yeah. <laughs> See, I'm going three. You, you know what does it for me? And I know huh. why they didn't do it. Yeah. He 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 looked like he should have had a ponytail. Yeah. He no, should have had it. You can't give everyone you can't a ponytail. Have two. Yeah, Seagal has a ponytail. You yeah. can't you can't go double but, ponytail. But he should have had it because the ponytail yeah. with the trench coat and the wetness of yeah. his hair, it yeah. would have worked. But and he you, could have pulled off a better ponytail because let me tell you, Seagal's ponytail in this, <laughs> it's like looking clip on to me. Yeah. But like, it was wispy. seagal has got dibs. You can't like he's can't not gonna, he's him. not going to give it up. He needed it. So he you can't it. you can't have two ponytails and Seagal's not going to give it up. It's like if you have an older brother, it's like you can call you can call <laughs> front seats all you want. You're not getting front seats. Can, <laughs> I I just didn't like his look. But you know we we didn't talk that's, about that's funny to me. Wow, I, we disagree. We didn't talk yeah. about his villainy because we we said that yeah. last week. I think right like how is he yeah. is he treacherous? And that's where I'll give him. Some points sure. on that because he was completely unhinged, and yeah, he just that's where that's where the crack whatever. pipe comes in, right? All right. So I feel like there's three things. There's you know very wispy mustache, kind of like a thin mustache, which is very villainous. And you got to remember it's 1991 as well. The the fashion in 91, people didn't know what the hell they wanted to wear. It's true. So he had mustache, he had slick back hair, scumbag, and he had a trench coat. Even if you wanted to give all of that a one. Yeah, you get an extra one for the crack pipe, which yeah. was in, which was all at all times in his possession. I forgot that we were doing accessories. Uh, yeah. You know, that's that's my yeah. fault. Uh, but any, you know what? If I can give his car an accessory, yeah, he had a car that had some pretty tinted out windows. It was like a yeah. Cadillac or something, yeah. right? I don't know. Maybe I'll meet you in the middle. You want to go two, or you? Or I'll give you the three if you want it. Let's go two point five. All right, two point five. I guess two point five. So 2. 5. he gets so so. If you want to be fair, you give him a one for his overall style. Yeah, you get an extra bonus point for the crack pipe, and you get a point five for the tinted out. Uh, is a tinted out car. Fair enough. All fair right? enough. Cool. And his villainy is pretty good. Like he even beat yeah. up like a guy in a wheelchair. Yeah, and like you have him. to. Yeah, you have to score him for being like a total psychopath. You, you steal someone's wheelchair that needs it. You're pretty yeah. much a scumbag. Yeah. He murdered in cold blood a paralyzed man. Like that's like he, he what, did. What are you even doing? He did. He like did. that's too much. It's too much. What about his hideout and his lair? Because I don't. He had a bunch of different places. I don't now, think were they any all of his? them. I don't think any of them were his. I think the car was his. That <laughs> <laughs> his car. Maybe we maybe we got to score the car <laughs> because <laughs> like he visited a lot of places. Yeah, they and were the, like mafia yeah, hideouts, and the bar wasn't really his hideout because Sakal went looking for him there and he wasn't there. <laughs> It's true. So Anybody I don't know. Look, this is a tough one. This is a tough and one. Maybe the bar, if we say the bar was his, maybe his brother was watching it. Yeah. Maybe that was we his. We can call the bar his. The warehouse certainly wasn't his was hideout. He just he visited hung out it. at that girl's house that used to be a prostitute. That but was pretty. But that's not his hideout either. He just happened. Not really. That's what just happened to be where he was. I mean, he took it over. Let's call it, let's call it, let, to be, to be easy, let's call the bar his The bar. Out. All right, yeah. I'm, I'm giving that a two because it's a sweet place. He had a bunch yeah. of guys. He had a room yeah. for the henchmen, which is yeah. which is later. I'm giving it a two. I think it's a, I think that's I, a good I like place. 
I like the 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 underground bar. Yeah, I'm a fan of like if I if we're going to a bar and I have to walk down some steps to get into it, that's like a a it's better a bar. That yeah, I like a basement bar. You got the basement bar. Personally, you like that? I like <laughs> that. I do. What's it your feels score? cool. It feels cooler. I'm still giving it a two. I mean, Let's it's still two. it's a it's a fine bar. You know, it's fine, but it's not great. It's a two. I think this is where we always say this, man. It's where he's going to lose the points. Yeah. His plan. Now you either can say it's awesome or it's awful. What do you say? I think his plan's kind of awesome for him because like if he's like going on a revenge killing spree and like this kill of a cop means that both the police and the mafia are going to try to kill him and he's going to take everyone down with him and he's okay with that. If he's okay with dying, then the plan's great. And it was a revenge plot, I guess. Yeah, yeah. So, like, you could say it's a bad plan because it's one way or another he's going to be murdered at the end of the end of the movie, and he knows that. Like, that's a bad plan, I guess, inherently. But if he's okay with this, if he has a death wish, it's a great plan. Is it, that's true. Yeah. Uh, but do you think it was his plan or the crack's plan? Like, is this is this uh, the crack speaking? That, yeah, that's, that's good. Yeah, yeah. So when, when did he find out that he had been cheated on by, by a cop? But we don't like, know. Was he high or not at the time? We know that Bobby's wife gave the pictures to him, which was the stupidest dumbest thing ever. Dumbest idea. Yeah. That was and, the dumbest and thing. And it was not malicious. Like she, she said she didn't want him to die. She wanted her husband back. She just wanted her husband back. And that was a very bad decision on her part. Dumbest thing ever. I it don't mean, know. You know what? The fact that she gave them to Richie means that they have some kind of relationship. So, so Bobby was probably like hiding stuff for Richie and probably like, you know, involved in his drug game. Makes me think that maybe he isn't as unhinged as we may have first thought because the wife had that kind of trust it's in him. It's the cutting room floor, man. It's so, on the cutting room floor. Yeah. So maybe he went on this crack bender because of the rage. Yeah. Right? It's he, he cracked himself to, yeah. to, to, to stupor. Yeah. So I don't sorrows. know. So I don't know whether that makes the plan better or worse. I, I, I'm going to give it, I'm going to give it a three and a half just because I, I think that like for a plan of like, this is my, for a criminal's last 24 hours, I think he did a bang up job. I, I'm okay with that. I think that makes yeah. sense. I think that makes sense. I don't condone it at all. I don't condone the murder of innocent people honking your horn, but like as, as a murdering bastard, not a bad plan. <laughs> What about the henchmen? Now, anybody that's going to get their leg shot off by a shotgun deserves a minus there, get their teeth yeah. knocked out. Like, so, they also didn't gang up on him. They just fought him yeah. one by one. We, we kind of... Uh, you may or may not agree with me. Do we have to grade this on a curve because they're fighting Seagal? It's not fair. I mean, maybe. It's you not fair. It's not fair to judge their skill when it's it is written that they're not allowed to touch Steven That's Seagal. That's true. But like I liked the mulleted, jean vested, bearded, toothless guy. That I was my him. favorite guy. Yeah, he's a good guy. But is that but, his henchman or was that his brother's henchman? I don't know. But I like if you could call the brother a henchman and and, and in turn every, all of his brother's henchmen are also his henchmen. He didn't have a sub boss. I mean, unless you want to call that guy the sub boss, I guess. Yeah. I, I don't know how you score there it. Is but no, yeah, I don't think there really is a true sub boss. I think, you know, the, the thing with, with Richie that was interesting was I think these guys are dumb because yeah. they stuck with him when they easily could have just left. Like he was going on this, this, like you said, a crack bender. Yeah. And they just stuck with him for what? They were clearly uncomfortable. Yeah. But they were just like going along and with it. You could also tell their knuckleheads they were having like stupid conversations while Forsyth was, Richie was like just clearly annoyed by it all. I, I would I would tend to give them a one, not all their performance, not getting a hit on Seagal, but in the fact that none of the guys in his main crew stood out to me. You know? Yeah, do, none of them. I mean, they had... Could you? Do you remember one guy over another guy doing anything no, special? not at all. Only yeah. the mullet guy because he had sweet, you know, yeah. like outfit. And that was, the bro- that, that was the brother's henchman. Uh, yeah, but the sticks. They, yeah, in Richie's main crew, there was, there was nothing. No, they were just, they yeah. drove him around. It's like an Uber driver. Yeah. That's it. Now, if Sticks in the bar gave Seagal a much better fight and actually you know hit him a few times, then maybe we bump it up a little bit. But They wasted happen. that guy. That yeah, guy was way them. too good, and they, they, they wasted him. Well, you so. know, Seagal probably saw what that guy had in him on set and, you know, was intimidated by him and probably cut <laughs> a lot of his good stuff. 
I'm going to give oh, it a one. Yeah. What, what do you say? You give it a one? I, I'm good with that, too. Yeah. So what do we got? We have two... Let, I'll recap for everybody. Look and style, a 2.5. Hideout and layer, a 2. Plan, 3.5. And the henchman is just a one. They're just weak. There's nobody memorable, to, to, to your point. So what does that give us? Yeah. Is that nine? I can't do math right now. It's like, uh, now it's five, six, six, seven, eight, nine. Yep. Yeah, we got nine, a nine out of 20. 20 which is... Uh, it's failing. It's a failing villain. It's a, it's Don't a do crack. Failing. Don't do crack, people. Don't do crack. You know what? And we, we said this... We joked about this last week. I, what was it? You know, we'll do for episode 100. We'll do the the overall villain thing. We don't know what episode it'll be, but maybe it'll be just so, like we did the JCVD split thing. If I, can make a, it. if I can make a quick observation, I feel like his plan scored higher than most. It did. On it, the scale. It did. Um, but I feel like everyone seems to lose points on the henchman. Very the rarely henchmen do, we, do, we, do we get good henchmen. You got to no. have a good, you got to have a sub boss. You got yeah, to. You, you got, you, you have to. Yeah. Let, let's, but in order to wrap this up, let's talk about the demise of Richie because yeah. we didn't really touch on that, but how did he go down? Did you feel like overall he was a good villain? Forget the score. Just yeah. forget the score. Yeah, I liked him. I thought he was like, and, and, and especially like the performance of William Forsyth. Like I good. thought, I thought like he, like he really like jumped into the role. He went kind of unhinged, and I, you know, he wasn't he wasn't afraid to go there. What'd you think of the the, the fight scene, the final fight, the the final boss fight? It was entertaining, but pathetic and predictable. You know, like the whole thing where like Sigal doesn't get hit. It was fine. It was fine. But like, you think about marked for death, like him fighting those, you know, those twins. Like those are yeah. good scenes, man. Even if yeah. he did, if he, even if he did mess those guys up just as easily, either. <laughs> Street like, face. Yeah. This fight did not have that feel to it. Like no, a, yeah, it was it kind was of like, like a whimper. Yeah, it was kind of a formality. I did like that he like shot him on the way out the door too. Yeah. That was kind of cool. When he he, you know why he did that too? He gave him to the mob boss basically, yeah. so he he could get away with it. And yeah. it, you know, he's, and also the mob guy because I the the thing that we didn't really talk about during the mob scene, and, and maybe it's just a kind of a passing comment is like he had this weird rivalry with the sub mob boss. And I got the impression that he was going to try to take them on, but then yeah. they were cool in the end. So it yeah. was really weird. And then uh, he basically gifted well, William Forsyth to him. Yeah, because the mob wanted Forsyth. And like Seagal was like, no, man, I'm going to take him. I'm going to get him first. He wanted to do it himself. Yeah. Which, like, let the mob take care of it. Yeah. Just do Why it. Would You're you? a cop. Yeah. I don't know. You shouldn't do that. Yeah. He's Seagal. <laughs> what are you going to do? What are you going to do? So maybe to wrap this up, we talked about. I think it was in Mark for Death or or Hard to Kill. I don't remember which episode we did this in. We'll have to go back and listen to it. We sort of ranked the Seagal classic movies. After having watched this now, and if you think about some of the classic Seagal movies, where does this fit in your pantheon of them? Because this was the first time I've actually seen yeah. this all the way through. Surprisingly. Yeah, man. Surprisingly, yeah, because this this is one of the tops, man. Yeah, I mean, it's it's got problems, and Seagal probably has too much of his fingerprints on it, but it's up there for sure. Yeah. Definitely enjoyable and fun. I don't know, man. I feel like this list changes every time I like try to try to like rank Seagal movies, or if I see one more recent than others, I might put one up higher. But I still feel like, I don't know. I feel like Mark for Death is probably higher for me at this point. I may have I said something different back then, but now I'm feeling Mark for Death. I agree with that. I think Mark for Death is my favorite one of all of them, yeah. just because of how ridiculous it is, yeah. and it's him teaming up with his friend. Yeah, and, and they're like, just wrecking stuff. Yeah. And the twist of like the twins, like yeah. the, the the playing the voodoo off as voodoo, but like it was really just like twin magic. I like that a lot. I like that. And then Alfred Justice might go second. I don't know. I do have a soft spot for Under Siege Two. That's a great Cole, movie. Cole in Dark Territory. It's a great movie. Yeah. It's it's a bad, great movie. Yeah. But it's great. Under Siege 1 is the best, like, legitimate movie that he's ever done. But it's not as enjoyable as some of his, like, quote-unquote bad ones. Like, like like Above the Law and Mark for Death and all that stuff. I don't know. I don't know. Hard to kill in that coma, though. Yeah. How could you not? How could you not like that? <laughs> it's really how could, good. How could you not? <laughs> I'll, I'll say this. This movie was what I needed when I watched it. I don't know. Yeah. I was just in the mood for it. Yeah. I had a blast watching this movie. 90 minutes in and out. Ridiculous fight scenes. Stupid car chases. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> if, you, if you could make a yeah. blueprint of like yeah. the movie that I would like, it's yep. this movie. You just, you know what I mean? I don't yep. watch other things. I, I watch Oscar winning yeah. movies. Yeah. But this is like the perfect movie for yeah. me. 
on a Friday night. Absurd wardrobe choices. I just that, love this stuff. movie. Like I wanted yeah. to, it's funny. I, I found myself taking pictures of everything and then like screenshotting it and also want to take videos. And at one point I'm like, you're going to watch this. Like I should just let you watch it because yeah. <laughs> it's just the whole movie yeah. is ridiculous. You like, you sent me like recaps of the movie. I'm like, well, I don't have to watch it now. You just, yeah. you just, you just saved I was me a so lot of time. excited by yeah. watching this stupid yeah. movie. So anyway, tell. it's up there and I don't know. I don't know if other people like this movie, if you've watched it, you know, I'm sure you'd love to watch it again after listening to this. If you haven't watched it, you don't need to, but I recommend that you do. I'm definitely curious what everybody thinks. Send us an email, thelastrowpodcast at gmail.com. Visit the website, thelastrowpodcast.com, on Twitter at thelastrowpod, Facebook, Instagram. Head out to Spotify. Hit the subscribe button if you're new to the show. Leave us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts and, and uh, Podchaser if you're enjoying the show. And thanks to everybody that left, someone, left one so far. We'll be back in two weeks. Two weeks. On Thursday, September 2nd, with a new episode for September. you guys. September. Jesus. Time's going, man. Time's going. Yeah. Well, so, uh, before we leave, I just have one question for you, Drew. Yes. Yeah. Anyone see Richie? See Richie? Anybody Bobby see Bo. Richie? Bobby Bo. Anybody remember seeing Richie? Keep coming back until somebody remembers seeing Richie.